Hi everybody, I'm Jack, the Rambling Raconteur. This is the Buried Treasure Book Tag. I uh, just so happen to have found a very special treasure map, and if you look very closely here, X marks the spot on this treasure map. I think to my daughters. And so we're about to go find some buried treasure, and as we do that, I hope you'll dig in with us. Here we go. Uh, this was originally created by Too Fond of Books. I was tagged by the Book Collectic, who is always uh, funny and, and just excited about what she finds and, and what she's reading. So here we go. Prompt one. A book that has been on your shelf for a long time but you have never talked about on your channel. I'm going to go with The Return of the Sorcerer, the best of Clark Ashton Smith. Um, he was sort of a contemporary of H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, those guys. He created the character um, Sathagua, uh, Sathagua, I'm not sure what it is, the, this massive toad creature. <laughs> and his stories, are, um, they lack some of the energy of Howard. They're a little bit weirder and more like um, opium-induced almost. <laughs> but, uh, but they're very weird. They're very fun. And they also don't have that like insane racism <laughs> that just like runs through H.P. Lovecraft. So this is, uh, this is actually one I often recommend to people to, if, they, if they've liked those stories, read some Clark Ashton Smith. He's a fun guy. All right, prompt two. <clears throat> This has been my favorite question on everybody else's videos. Uh, Lost Cunningham's was glorious with the, <laughs> this copy of The Forever War. I don't have one that's quite as good. Uh, a book where the cover's so awful it's actually awesome. This is my copy of The Dying Earth. And this is a, a fairly old copy. This is, what is this? This is a 1972 printing. And you've got the guy with the cool robe and satchel and sword and this woman with a bizarre shape but then there's this thing and i don't know what the heck that is uh the dying earth though is great it was a big influence on dungeons and dragons if you're a fan of that prompt three a book that you wish everyone would read i've mentioned this before but i think only once um it's wide sargasso sea by uh gene rice and it's basically a response a parallel text to uh jane eyre by charlotte bronte um, it, it lets you see a different side of uh, what life would be like during that, you know, uh, Regency era, between the Regency era and the Victorian era. Well, what's actually going on kind of on the other side of the coin? It's an excellent book. Prompt four, a well-known author's underappreciated work. Well, I didn't want to, you know, with the buried treasure tag, I didn't want to leave out George MacDonald Fraser, who's best known for Flashman, but he also wrote this ridiculous book called The Pirates. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the, the more serious one is Emily Bronte's poetry. She's very well known for Wuthering Heights, which is a powerful book. Uh, some people don't think it's excellent, but her poetry is fantastic. Uh, she's not, ironically, she's not included in some of the... Um, like poetry anthologies that she probably should be included in. And I think it's because Wuthering Heights is such like a, a an overshadowing text. But I want to just give uh, an example of one poem. Here we go. Love is like the wild rose briar, friendship like the holly tree. The holly is dark when the rose briar blooms, but which will bloom most constantly? The wild rose briar is sweet in spring. Its summer blossoms scent the air. Yet wait till winter comes again, and who will call the wild briar fair? Then scorn the silly rose wreath now, and deck thee with the holly sheen, that when December blights thy brow, he still may leave thy garland green. I think her 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 poetry is just has that same overpowering sensibility, just suffused with life and nature, and and a deep probe into human the human soul, human consciousness, and I love her poetry uh, just as much as I, th and I think it has just as much power as Wuthering Heights. Prompt five, the oldest edition of a book on your shelves. I think it's this. I might be wrong. This is a 1926 edition of Everybody's Peeps. It doesn't have the dust jacket anymore, but it's in fairly good work for being over 90 years old at this point. Uh, this book is older than any of my grandparents were. And it uh, it's in pretty good condition. The spine's a little like the, I'm gonna have to repair it eventually with the inside sew, uh, sewing, but the threads, but 
it's in pretty good condition. And uh, it's a great way to introduce yourself to peeps and what a strange, strange dude he is. <laughs> There's buried treasure within this book where he just has these <laughs> random little expostulations and uh, the, the, just the little variety, um, various moments of life that bubble up are, are quite fun. Here we go. Uh, prompt six, an author on your shelves that you've never heard anyone else talk about. Well, not on like the booktube channels, but that's going to be Newton Thornburg. So he has a book, Cutter and Bone, which was filmed as Cutter's Way and kind of wiped the power of that book. This is a terrifying book. Uh, it deals with sort of that idea of, um, you know, post-traumatic stress. There's a character who's a Vietnam veteran and clearly has like post-traumatic stress and has like, you know, uh, some physical disabilities from his service time. Um, there is, there, there's a character who's sort of like burned out on life and like the, that side of the American dream where you've just sort of washed out and, you know, you can't play the game anymore. And what happens is uh, a, a, a man is drunkenly like leaving his car one night he sees a uh, another man like down the alley put something in a dumpster or like pull something out and just leave it in the alley and he uh, he later on realizes he thinks that the guy he saw doing that and, and there, it was a, you know a woman's body it was a murder victim he thinks that the person he saw doing that is the same picture as this like uh, industrial like wealthy industrialist who's from Arkansas or Missouri, so somewhere in like that part of like not the deep south, but that more um, like mountain wooded area uh, west of the south, and before you get to the Great Plains, so it it just becomes this wild like nightmarish mystery where you have people who are totally incapable of detection trying to engage in a detective story, and the the way that it explores the U.S. is just absolutely fascinating. The way it explores crime is fascinating. It's a crime novel that doesn't feel like a crime novel. Um, this year, this summer probably, I'm going to read his book, uh, To Die in California. Never read it, so please don't spoil it if you have. But I'm pretty excited for this. Uh, it, uh, you know. Anyways, Newton Thornburg. Great, underrated, weird crime writer. Uh, prompt 7. A book you love... From your shelves that you haven't read in over five years. I looked this up and tried to get as close to five years ago as possible and find a book that I really liked. Uh, this is 1977, which is the second volume in David Peace's Red Riding Quartet. This is maybe the darkest volume and scariest volume. It deals with a real life uh, set of killings called the Yorkshire Ripper, uh, who was sort of like Jack the Ripper as the pastiche there, as the homage there. And so, um, there, there were actual killings. The crime was solved, but maybe not. North England had a whole issue with, uh, with like police corruption throughout the 70s and, and, er, and 1980s as well. And so uh, this is, some people say this is their favorite of his Red Riding Quartet novels. It might be mine. Uh, we get two characters. One is Jack Whitehead, who is a crime reporter. The other is uh, Detective Bob Fraser, who's sort of like the golden boy of a wildly corrupt, you know, police department. And we see that it is a, it is a horror story really wrapped up as a mystery. And it's fantastic. It, it, I'm on a reread of the Red Riding Quartet and that book has actually come up this year. So <laughs> delightful, perfect time. Uh, prompt eight, a book you remember reading in childhood. This is not my copy, but this is The Sneetches and other stories by Dr. Seuss, and specifically The Sneetches, the ones where some have stars on their bellies and some don't. And then there's this whole like class war between those who have stars and those who don't, and the huckster who comes and will <laughs> put on stars, and once everybody has stars, wait a second, uh, we want to get ours off, we're going to reverse the class structure, and it just keeps going on. And I remember that story as a kid and how weird it felt, you know, how that, that idea of like people will do anything to try and, and fit in or, or they'll use anything to try and create these labels. And so I remember as a kid thinking it was a powerful story. The copy I had was like a thick paperback like this, but the cover and back cover were torn off. 
and the stitching was falling apart, so you had to be really careful when you turned the pages. This is my daughter's copy. Um, so there you go. Uh, prompt nine. This one, I couldn't find my copy. It's buried somewhere in the shelves. Or I, I, I may have lent it to someone, which I think is what happened. Prompt nine. A book you love from a genre you don't tend to read from. I read sparingly from experimental fiction. I do read it. I've read, uh, you know, particularly there are some works that were experimental at their time and are classics now. Ulysses is a, an example of that. <laughs> um, Michael and Dodge, yeah, his early works like Coming Through Slaughter and the collected works of Billy the Kid sort of spring to mind and some of John Barth's work. But uh, the experimental fiction book that I find really interesting and really bizarre and really, you know, scary uh, is House of Leaves uh, by Mark Danielewski, maybe? I can't remember his last name either. Uh, but anyways, it is a great book. It's weird. You have to jump all around. Um, and there are different font types that are clues. There's text that looks redacted. And it's it's just this, you know, again, it's a, it's a uh, love story masquerading as a horror story, if 1977 is the horror story masquerading as a crime novel. So, prompt 10, tag a book tour who has buried treasure on the shelf. I'm going to go with two. One is Matthew at Maybury Book Club because he has more Penguin Classics copies than I do. He has way more Oxford World Classics copies than I do. And he also has a lot of NYRB Classics copies. Uh, and so I want to know what's on more of those shelves. And then the other one is uh, new to BookTube. He's been commenting a lot. He reads a lot of crime novels. He, um, even more, way more than I have. And he's also watched a lot of great old movies. Is uh, Duncan McCurdy or McCurdy? Uh, who's fantastic. He just started his channel last week. So thank you everybody and dig in with those.